Hello, and welcome to chapters 9 through 12 of The Best Bad Luck I Ever Had. Here we go, chapter 9, Throwing Stones. It finally stopped raining that evening after supper, and I went to hang out on Mrs. Pooley's front porch. Doc Haley sat in one of the rockers while me and Elbert played marbles in the mud. It was a nice, quiet evening with no one saying much. After a game and a half, Bigfoot wandered out, out of the store onto his mama's front porch. Soon as Doc saw him, he jumped up. Come on, Elbert, Doc said. I'm right in the middle of a game, Elbert protested. Sorry, son, it's time to go. Me and Elbert divvied up our marbles, and he and Doc went on home. Bigfoot sat in the empty chair without saying a word. I headed home soon after that. Soon after that. It was already dark. The moon was out, so I could see just fine to practice my pitching, which I did by throwing rocks at each of the houses I passed. I'd pick a spot, maybe ten inches square, above a door or between two windows, and throw the rock at it. I'd heard once... That was how the great pitcher Walter Johnson had perfected his aim, and ever since I'd practiced that way myself. I hit Dr. Griffith's place first. He moved to town five or six years ago, and his wife died two years after that, so now he lived alone in their large wooden house. The oak front door made a nice thunk when the rock hit it. Next to Dr. Griffith's house was a smaller house that he rented out to the school teacher. We had only one teacher in our primary school, which went from first to eighth grade. As far back as anyone could remember, the teacher had been Mr. Summons, but the old man had finally died, choked on a fishbone while he was eating his supper. His housekeeper found him a pile of ungraded papers under his head. So, Mrs. Say had recently moved into the house. She was a young widow from a rich family who had been educated at the University of Alabama. Most people said she wouldn't be a school teacher for long. She was too pretty not to get married again. I hadn't met her, but I had heard Mama gossiping about her, so I crept up to the window to see what she was like. I guess she hadn't had time to hang her curtains, because I could see her clearly reading by the fireside. She sure was pretty. Her long blonde hair was braided and pinned up high on her head. Her dress had lace all over it and looked more suited to a fancy party than sitting at home reading a book. Round her neck, she wore string, a string of pearls. I could even see the book she was reading, Democracy and Education by one John Dewey. What kind of foolishness was that? Ain't no democracy in school. Everyone knows that. The teacher is boss, and if you forget that, you're going to end up with one sore bottom. I had seen enough, so I moved a couple of steps back and took aim at the little dark patch of wood above her window. I pulled my arm back, then right before I let the stone fly, Emma stepped out of the darkness. It was exactly the wrong moment to surprise me. Too late for me to stop my throw, but early enough to distract me. Instead of bouncing harmlessly off the wood, the rock sailed through the closed window, shattering the glass. We both winced and ran for the bushes. Peeking through the leaves, we could see Mrs. Say pick up a kerosene lamp and walk toward the front door. The door opened and she stepped outside. Who's there? She called sharply. Her long dress billowed in the night breeze. Emma took a deep breath, like she was going to say something, but I grabbed her shoulder. She shut up. Mrs. Say walked right by the bush where we were hiding, scanned the yard twice, then went back inside. I let out a sigh of relief and, and let my grip on Emma relax. She squirmed away. You shouldn't be throwing rocks at people's houses. It's your fault, I spit back at her. If you hadn't startled me, I wouldn't have broke her window. You have to go tell her what you did. No, I whispered through clenched teeth. Are you crazy? Then I will. She brushed a clump of wet dirt off her dress. Emma, you can't tell, I pleaded. Why not? I'm saving money for the fourth hunt. I can't afford to pay for a broken window. Should have thought of that before you broke it. Emma stood up and looked over toward the front door. I'll tell everyone you're a snitch. So, Emma replied, none of the kids will want to play with you. None of the kids play with me anyway. I do. Only because your mama makes you. I wanted to say that wasn't true, but it was. So I finally just said, please don't tell. Emma pretended to mull it over, but I think she already had a whole thing worked out in her head. Teach me to throw a ball and I won't tell. Emma, I sighed, you ain't no good at baseball. I want to learn. I shook my head. Fine, she started toward Mrs. Say's front door. Wait, I said. Emma paused. Teach me to throw a ball, she repeated, and I'll keep your secret. I looked up at the broken window. Mrs. Say was inside, sweeping up glass shards. I looked back at Emma and nodded. The next day, me and Emma spent hours on the banks of the Black Warrior River, throwing small, smooth stones. I don't want to learn to throw stones, Emma protested. I want to throw a baseball. You got to learn how to keep your eye on the ball, I explained, and how to throw and how to aim. And the best way to learn all of that is by skipping stones. She didn't complain no more after that. My stones would skip across the water like they was flying. Hers would fall in the water with a loud kerplunk. 
But I gotta give her one thing. That girl was stubborn. I tried for three hours to show her how it was done, and never and she never got more than one skip. I thought that I thought that was the end of it. If my friend Chip didn't catch on to something right away, he called it stupid and gave up. So I was surprised when Emma came over the next day. She watched us weed the vegetable garden till Mama stopped and asked her what she wanted. Dit was teaching me to skip stones yesterday, Mrs. Sims. Did you get the hang of it? Mama asked, wiping her hands on her apron. No, Mrs. Sims. It was my first time, since I wasn't allowed to go to the river by, by myself in Boston. Well then, said Mama, sounds like you need yourself another lesson. Three more hours on the riverbank and Emma Stone still fell flat into the water. The whole thing seemed pointless to me. I knew there was no way Emma was ever going to learn how to skip stones, but I didn't want her to tell on me, so I guess I had to keep trying to teach her. Sooner or later, she decided to give up on her own. You're getting it, I lied. No, I'm not, said Emma. You're not holding the stones right, I said for the fifth time. Show me again, said Emma. So I took her hand in mine and I wrapped it around a smooth, flat stone. Her fingers were cool and stiff, but her skin was beautiful, kind of like the mud in a creek after a hard rain. I rubbed her hands between mine, trying to get the blood running. She watched me. Then I said, try it again. She took the stone and threw it so hard it skipped seven or eight times across the water. We both stood there with our mouths open. I'm not sure who was more surprised. Oh, did you did it, she exclaimed. You taught me to throw stones. I didn't do nothing, I said. You figured it out yourself. But it sure made me feel good that she'd said it. And I started to do some thinking. Taking Emma to the top of my mound hadn't gotten rid of her. She hadn't cried on the fishing trip, not even when we had to walk through the rain and the mud to Jim Dangit's. Now Emma had gone and learned how to skip stones when I thought she couldn't. Maybe there was other stuff I was wrong about, too. Maybe Emma was someone who'd make a good friend. While I was thinking and wondering, Emma picked up another stone and threw it as hard as she could. It fell into the water with a loud kerplunk. She just laughed and picked up another stone. This one skipped four or five times. Emma let out a delighted scream. We stood there till the sun went down, skipping stones. Chapter 10, The Cave Emma sure wasn't like no other girl I'd ever met. She told me about the museum she had visited in Boston and had a set of paints like a real artist. Emma didn't approve of sneaking into places unless it was the Negro church so she could play the organ. She used to have piano lessons at her school in Boston and had a book of songs by people like Bach and Mozart. She said they were from faraway places like Germany and Austria. I pointed out that we were at war with Germany and she shouldn't be aiding an enemy by playing their music. How is playing their music going to aid them? Emma asked. No, I didn't have no answer, and uh, the music was kind of pretty, so I just sat back and listened. It's not like Emma knew everything. In some ways, she was plumb stupid. She had never built a fort or played hide-and-seek in the woods. When we, de when we decided to dig a secret hideout in one of the mounds, I had to show her everything. We weren't working two minutes till Emma started complaining. I'm getting blisters, she said, staring at her hand. You're holding the shovel wrong. I came over and showed her where to place her hands. She tried scooping up some more dirt with the shovel. Better? I asked. I think so. Good, but you're still going to get blisters. I showed Emma how to spread out the dirt on the side of the mound so it didn't make a huge bulge or fall down in big clumps. If we were going to have a secret hideout, we couldn't have everyone knowing where it was. After an hour of work, I was covered with dirt and had to lie down in the tall grass to rest. But Emma was working at the same slow pace, looking like she had just bathed for church. Did you ever build a cave back in Boston? I asked. No, said Emma. There wasn't anywhere like this. We lived in a row house. What's that? I asked. A bunch of houses built next to each other so that they share walls. You can build a whole bunch of row houses in one city block, maybe nine or ten. Nine or ten houses on one block? I asked. Emma shrugged. Maybe more. There were always people around sitting outside on their front porches vis visiting, kind of like people do at Mrs. Pooley's store. I thought for a moment. Guess there'd, guess there'd be a lot of people to play with. Yeah, said Emma quietly, and a lot of noise, too. What, did, what if you need a little peace and quiet? I'd go to my room and read a book. Didn't you have a tree to sit in or a field to run around in? There was a park across town, but we had to take a streetcar there, and Mama didn't like me to go alone, and it cost a dime. I imagined having to pay a dime every time I wanted to see a tree or look at the sky or just be still and listen to my thoughts. If I had to live in one of those row houses, maybe I'd take up reading too. Chapter 11. Root Beer and Hard Tech It took me and Emma about a week, but we finally had a cave big enough so that we could both crawl inside. 
We went to the riverbank and picked up two large stones and used them to pack the walls hard and smooth. Sunlight trickled in the vines that we'd woven together for the, for the door, making shapes of light in the dirt floor. Know what would make this absolutely perfect? I asked. What? A bottle of soda, I said. How about a whole case of soda? Emma suggested. It'd stay cool in the cold in the cave. I thought this over. I had a couple of dimes at home and almost a whole year to save for the fourth hunt. We can split up the cost, Emma continued. Mama gave me some money when we took the train down from Boston. I nodded. Sounds good to me. Me and Emma ran home to get our money. I picked up the wagon to pull the soda in and to pull the soda in and we headed over to Mrs. Pooley's store. When we got there, Bigfoot was sitting in one of the rocking chairs, his feet propped up on, on an empty box. Well, if it ain't Dit and his end girl, he took another sip of his beer. I didn't know what to do. I'd heard Bigfoot call colored folks in our town names before, but not right to their face. Hello, Bigfoot, I said. Emma didn't say anything. Ain't your mama trained you right, Bigfoot said to Emma. A white man speak to you, you say hello. Hello, mumbled Emma, and then turned to me. I'm going inside. I waved bye to Bigfoot and followed Emma inside. I found her standing in the back of the store, staring at her shoes. You all right? I asked. I don't like that man, Emma said. Nobody likes him much. Emma said nothing. Cream or root beer? I asked. What? What kind of soda you like? Root beer, Emma said. Me too, I said and handed her my dime. Emma paid Mrs. Pooley for the soda while I loaded the case into my wagon. We went out the back door just in case Bigfoot was still there. On the way back to the mound, Emma suggested we stop at the post office to say hi to her daddy. That was fine with me. Mr. Walker sometimes asked me and Emma to help him sort the mail. Emma thought this was boring, but I kind of liked it. Besides, the post office was right next to the train depot, and I was always up for a little train watching. Soon as we entered, Mr. Walker looked up from his record book and grinned. Boy, I sure am glad to see you two. My leg is hurting something awful today. Think you could stay a while and help me sort the mail? Sure, I said. Mr. Walker found Emma a sharp knife, and, and I dragged the mailbag over to the corner with the mailboxes. Emma split open the bag, and we started pulling out the piles of letters, bills, and catalogs. We had to put everything in the right mailbox. My family's was number four, 14. I got into a rhythm while I worked. Gl glance at the letter, see the number, stick it in the box. Found it kind of relaxing. But Emma was awful quiet. You okay? I asked. Of course. Emma kept sorting the letters into piles. Was she still upset about Bigfoot? Should I have said something to him when he when he was nasty to her back at the store? I wanted to ask her what she thought, but I wasn't sure if that would make things worse. Mr. Walker was still s standing across the room from the front counter, so I finally just lowered my voice and asked, What happened to your daddy's leg? I don't want to talk about it. Before I could press her about it, my pa came into the post office. He and Mr. Walker had been friendly since the fishing trip, and I thought that maybe he was stopping by just to say hello. Hi, pa, I cried out. Pa hardly looked at me as he rushed over to the counter where Mr. Walker was working. Do you have the new Sears and Roebuck catalog? Pa didn't say hello to Mr. Walker either, but that only made me feel a little better. Yes, Mr. Walker said, reaching into his desk and pulling it out. Is something wrong? Thank goodness, said Pa, wiping his forehead with his sleeve. Can you place an order by telegraph? There's been so much rain, half my core is, corn is rotting in the field. I thought if I could get more seed by next week, I might be able to... The corn is rotting? I asked. Pa glanced over at me. Oh, hello, Omen. Dit, I corrected. Yes, did, of course. He flipped through the catalog Mr. Walker handed him until he found the right page. This is what I need. Let me get the form, said Mr. Walker. Are we going to starve, Pa? I asked as Mr. Walker was searching for the correct form. What? Pa kept his eyes on the catalog. If you don't get that seed, are we going to starve? No, of course not, said Pa. Might not be able to send Ollie to that teaching college she's got her eye on, but we won't starve. Found it, said Mr. Walker, picking up a pen off the counter. Now just tell me what you wanted to say. But if we don't have no corn, I continued, how are we going to feed the cows, pigs, and chickens? Did I don't have time to answer all your little questions, he turned to Mr. Walker. How many words do I get for 50 cents? I'm working, I muttered under my breath, but Pa didn't hear me. Emma did and opened her mouth to say something, but just then a train whistle blew. Trains pass through Moundville six times a day, 7 a.m., 9 a.m., 12 noon, 4 p.m., 7 p.m., and 9 p.m. The post office clock said it was almost 4.30 now, so it couldn't be one of the trains on the daily schedule. I glanced out the window. The train wasn't stopping, just chugging slowly through the station. A man stuck his head out of the train car window and yelled, We're off to get Kaiser Bill! 
It's packed with soldiers, I cried as I put down the mail I was sorting. Come on! Me and Emma ran out of the post office in order to, and over to the train depot. The United States had just entered the Great War, and I guess the soldiers were getting ready to ship out. The soldiers waved like crazy when they saw me and Emma on the platform. Good luck, Emma yelled and waved. Show those Germans what's what, I added. A young man with a shaved head poked his head out the window and cried, We'll be home by Christmas! Then he threw something out of the window. It was a thick, round cracker. Pretty soon, the others were throwing them, too, and by the time the train had made it through the station, the platform was covered with crackers. Emma ran back to get an old mailbag, and Mr. Walker came back with her to help us gather them. My father wasn't with him. I put a cracker in my mouth and bit down. Ow, I said. It's as hard as a piece of wood. Mr. Walker laughed. It's hard tacked it. Never goes bad, so the soldiers carry it with them in their packs. Can't even break it with a hammer. But if you soak it in your mouth or in a pot of water, it'll slowly dissolve. Why they throw it to us? asked Emma. Mr. Walker shrugged. It's good luck. So me and Emma added that bag of hardtack to my wagon, planned to store it in our cave along with the soda. Figured if Pa didn't get his seed in time and we got real hungry, I could take some and gnaw take some home and gnaw at it like a dog on a bone. Chapter 12, The Bowl. The sun was starting to go down by the time we finally got the wagon full of root beer and hardtack back to our cave. Walking up and down the mound so many times had carved a little path into the side, but it was still hard hauling the wagon up between the prickly bushes. When we finally reached the entrance to our cave and shoved all the soda and crackers inside, we realized it wasn't quite as large as we thought, because now there was barely enough room for the two of us. So the next day, we returned with our shovels and, pick and picks and set about making the cave bigger. We hadn't been digging long when Emma gasped. What's wrong? I asked. You pop a blister again? This had caused quite a bit of upset the week before. No, Emma scoffed. I found something. A bowl. We both crawled out of the cave to look at the bowl in the sunlight. It was shaped like a pumpkin with a wide stem, except it was covered with a shiny black glaze. There was a picture on the side. I brushed away some of the dirt. A drawing of a hand with an eye in the middle of the palm was scratched into the pottery. What does it mean? asked Emma, pressing her palm against the one on the bowl. I shrugged. Her hand was exactly the same size as the drawing. Let's go ask Jim Dang it, said Emma. He's half Indian, isn't he? So off we went. What you dang kids up to? Jim asked when we arrived at his cabin. He was outside cutting branches from a low-hanging tree. We found this, said Emma, holding up the bowl. Can you tell us what it is? Jim Dang it dropped his handsaw and took the bowl from Emma. He cradled it in, in his arms like a baby. He traced his fingertips over the drawing, then turned the bowl slowly in his hands. He held the bowl up to his eyes and peeked inside. He blew a short breath into the bowl and then put it to his ear to listen. Finally, he put the bowl down on his front stoop and took a step back. This dang thing, he said slowly, is a sign. A sign of what? asked Emma. This bowl was used by the Indians. When someone died, they filled it with water and placed it in a fire so that their loved ones would not go thirsty on their journey to the underworld. The hand and the eye stand for the God who made everything and the God who sees everything. Emma listened wide-eyed. I was more interested in the fact that this was the first time I'd ever heard Jim, dang, or Jim say more than a word or two without saying dang. You found this dang bowl on the very anniversary of my wife's death. He shook his head. It's a sign. A sign of what? I repeated Emma's question. Jim Dang had ignored me. He had Emma hold the bowl as he carefully filled it with water. Then he ordered me to pick up the green branches he had been cutting and told us both to follow him. Jim led us to the top of one of the mounds. There was a pile of wood already gathered there and a small folded blanket. He knelt down and began to build a fire. What are you doing? asked Emma politely, still clutching the bowl. My wife died 15 years ago today. This is how I show her that I love her and miss her. Jim closed his eyes and his lips moved briefly with a silent prayer. When the fire was burning well, Jim Dangit had me throw the green branches on top of it. Soon the fire began giving off a thick stream of smoke. Jim unfolded the blanket and held it over the fire. Every so often, he'd snap it quickly away, sending a clear smoke signal up to the heavens. This went on for a long time. Finally, Jim Dangit put down the blanket and nodded at Emma. She stepped forward and gave him the bowl. He carefully placed it into the center of the fire. The flames hissed as a bit of water sloshed over the side. We leave the bowl here until all the water is gone, Jim smiled. My wife will be so pleased you gave her this gift. I hadn't meant to give the bowl to Jim Dangit and his dead wife. I'd wanted to keep it, or at least sell it to someone to make a little money for the fourth hunt. It wasn't fair. Emma found the bowl. If I didn't get it, then she should. Seemed like a waste to burn it up. 
No one said much as we walked home. I was too busy thinking. Pottery was made under great heat. Putting it in a little fire like that probably wouldn't harm it at all. I decided when the fire burned and the bowl had cooled, I'd sneak back and take it. But the next day, when I returned to the top of the mound, the bowl was gone. Jim must have gone back to get it. He was half Indian. Maybe one of his relatives had made the bowl a long, long time ago. Maybe it was right for his dead wife to have it after all.